Hello, good people. Welcome to our show. Hello, bad people. Welcome to our show. Hello, no bad guys. People. No, no, no. We don't want bad people. Ah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, so, sometimes I confuse. I am bad, you know. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but I think uh, we don't need to divide bad, good. Uh, just to welcome anyone who want to learn more about transform transformation tales with Mitch Joel. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Oh, big pleasure. Big pleasure. I know about your experience. Awesome. I love it. Uh, Mitch. Uh, I think many people know you, but for someone who doesn't know, just uh, more about your experience, background, and why you pay attention to uh, such topics like transformation tales. Oh, I mean, I've been in this industry since the late 80s. I think the first time I was given access to a computer in the early 80s, my Atari 800 through my parents, it, it latched me onto the technology. And then the early days of BBSs and modems for sure made me very really passionate about connecting and audiences and being able to find people who just weren't based where you were. Professionally, I started off as a music journalist. I was at, uh, involved in companies that were at the very early days of the pre-commercialization and then the commercialization of the internet. Uh, early 2000s, uh, along with a couple of partners, we launched a digital marketing agency called Twist Image. In that agency, we launched a blog and a podcast called Six Pixels of Separation, which led to me doing a lot of public speaking. It led to the publishing of two books. One of them was Six Pixels of Separation. The other one was called Control Alt Delete. I uh, built that business up, sold it about 10 years ago to a large public company. And then when I left, I just continued doing what I do, which is speaking about the intersection of brands, consumer technology behavior. And then not that long ago, I launched a new startup called Thinkers One, where companies can buy bite-sized and personalized thought leadership from some of the best thinkers in the world. And I still write and talk about this space and host shows of my own like you. And I'm just generally curious about work, technology, and this crazy world we're all finding ourselves in. Awesome, awesome. I love your experience. One question I can't avoid. Uh, when I open your LinkedIn profile, I can see on the background Seth Godin. I love this guy. Hi, I nice read too. a lot of his books. Yeah, he's great. And you mentioned you publish book uh, books as well. And, you know, uh, I'm busy. I'm so busy to read all awesome books, uh, many great books. But uh, I, I think it's the same issue with my audience. Uh, they want to read books, but we have limited time, only 24 hours a day. Uh, Mitch, can you tell benefits of reading your books because I have a huge list of books that I'm going to read and I want to put your books on my list and uh, I think my audience will do as well if you give a strong reason to read your books and what kind of benefits we can get by reading them. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure that I could give you a clear immediate benefit only because the books were published over a decade ago. I haven't written a book in a, in a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think there are two th realities from that. One is the world of technology has changed so dramatically. And so my story is that the books are a moment in time with a lot of content before it and a lot of content after it. So if you go to the link below that says sixpixels.com, you'll see a lot of the evolution of that thinking and my weekly podcast and the articles and radio uh, segments that I, that I create. That being said, Feedback I've heard from people who've read it recently is more along the lines of it really provides an interesting perspective when you consider that as much as things have changed and platforms didn't exist like TikTok back when I wrote yeah. the books, the actual philosophy or the ideology around it is still very powerful, which is you know, we live in a world where everybody is intrinsically connected and anyone can create content in text, images, audio, video, live pre-recorded short form, long form, and build an audience. And to this day, we see people who start a lot later than I did have much larger audiences and build uh, communities and cultures. So I think the core of it remains very, very true and viable. But I, it's not one of those books where I think people need to definitely go back and read it. That being said, I think people do have time and make time for the things that are important to them. To me, reading books is one of, if not the primary place I go when I want content. So the ways in which we find time to watch 
40 hours of a series on Netflix or we'll watch, you know, one podcast that's three or four hours, the argument could be made that you could watch a podcast that's an hour and a half or listen to one and then mm -hmm. spend reading a book. So uh, to me, when people say they don't have time to read books, I usually translate that as they don't want to read books. Yeah. <laughs> <They> <laughs> read books. You'll find time to, re to read books for sure. 100%. Yeah. It's better to prioritize your time yeah. to optimize. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to do a lot of things, but I usually skip something less necessary because of reading books, I get a lot of great insights Me by too. reading books. And uh, uh, about marketing, uh, you started a digital marketing agency or company. Uh, and uh, what I like in marketing um, that, for example, I love some books that were written before digital, like Purple Cow, like uh, uh, Josh Ugerman wrote great books uh, before digital. And I can relate all these insights to digital. Uh, I have the feeling that these books were written before digital. Of course, technologies are growing fast, but humans are the same. I mean, like uh, psychology, why they buy, uh, what can push them to buy, how to uh, retain on your content. So uh, I think um, any books are great uh, if they touch human psychology, not all grips. Uh, and Mitch, can you tell about technologies, especially in marketing? Uh, they're growing fast. And for example, AI, um, I think today, 100% of marketers can use AI or adapt to AI. Uh, I check studies that in other occupations, it's not the same. Like um, only 25% of uh, companies adapt to, to AI. In digital marketing, 100%. Uh, uh, that is why I like digital marketing. It's quickly changing world. We need to adapt to move forward. Can you tell your methods, how you do it? For example, uh, if things uh, are changing, uh, how to uh, analyze what you can adapt, what you can skip. So any tips about that? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to AI, I think it's important that we take a little bit of a step back. So when I see statistics and data like that, it's not surprising. If we think about just regulation, how we're thinking about it, you've seen things like the Biden government only put forward their thoughts on AI as early as yesterday. I'd also make the argument that many organizations may not be deploying it because they haven't put in place enough around it in terms of what information should be put into these large language models and databases, what should be the conduct of employees, how much information they want to go into these more public platforms. And I do think it's really important for companies to think about the safety and the rail guards around this technology, because it would be very easy to put in information that might be IP, that might be very important for them, and someone innocuously putting it in because they want to create some email marketing newsletter and not realize that now this information is part of a grander system that can perhaps understand it or use it or provide it to a competitor in another way. So the safeguarding, the safety and privacy around these tools is really important. So my recommendation to all marketers is before you start playing with it is really ensure that the organizations that you work for understand what's going on. And then even if you are an entrepreneur or you are self-employed, start thinking really seriously about the fact that you are putting into it some of your IP and creativity. You want a better result. You want it to, to, to work with you, and that's all great. But ultimately, you're still doing it that way. That being said, my general attitude, whether it's using tools like generative AI or social media or any digital tools, is typically the same, which is I like the word tinker. And I think it's important for anybody to tinker with the technology, to stress test it, to see where it can and can't benefit you. So you might see something like TikTok would be a great example of this and think it's a great short form video content delivered in a very unique way. But you might reflect on this and think I'm not that great at producing video content like that. I might be better well suited to creating posts on Twitter or or videos for YouTube, or even an audio podcast. It doesn't have to be that. So I typically look at it as a content engine. What is working on these channels? Why is it interesting? How can it benefit me? And then I decide if I want to be a consumer or creator or curator. 
And I think if you can think of all of the channels and opportunities like that, it's harder with AI because you need to, to do the input, but on content-based channels, it's, it's much easier to do that. So that's the way I typically approach it. I have to admit when it comes to generative AI, because that seems to be the hot topic now, I find it extremely helpful for the work that I do. In fact, I can't think of anything that I create, whether it's text, images, audio, or video, where I don't use it as some way, as some type of co-pilot to my work. And again, a lot of it is stress testing. If I write an article, I'll ask it to come up with some opposing perspectives just so that I can understand where I might have my own confirmation bias or how my own filter bubbles are working. I might have it take a kick at the can at creating titles. I'm not really good at creating headlines and titles. And so I'll often use that as a way to stimulate an idea. It's very rare. I'll just copy and paste it. So I'm not looking at that technology as a way to create or replace me. I'm looking at it as a way to provoke and inspire. Oh, nice. I, I, I couldn't agree more because I see this trap often you know, when companies uh, check best practices and try to create content uh, with their big sites. Uh, you need to consider your strong side. If you can write, why you need to jump on TikTok? If you are not passionate about that, if you don't know how to film these videos or just suffer by filming them. Yeah, leave it. <laughs> right. You can write great. Uh, I mean, like Stephen King, he, he doesn't film TikTok. <laughs> like uh, Seth Godin, I don't know, probably. Yeah, but there's certain people, in fairness to this idea, have distribution and platform already. So when you talk about someone like Stephen King or Seth Godin, they have book publishers, they have other people with large distribution networks that are interested in their content. I'm not belittling the fact that every single day Seth puts out a beautiful gem of intellect that he shares with the world. He was one of the first, there's no doubt, and it still is one of the best. But he also has platforms beyond that that most people don't. Can they get there? They can. He even describes it in all of his books and he, he brings it together in this idea of drip, drip, drip. You slowly create content that creates that awareness, that creates that community, and it builds to the point where maybe you get a book deal or maybe you have a large publisher of some type of content want to connect with you. But Stephen King has a book publisher. He has a built-in audience. For other individuals, you might be able to search that out, but I think it's a fair argument to figure out a way in which you can build it on your own because then it's really audience by proxy. Meaning if the publisher decides to no longer publish Stephen King, there are competitive publishers that would take his work because he's Stephen King. Yeah. But in a scenario where you're not Stephen King, that could in theory block you off from that audience that even though you've built it with your work, it's owned by another party. Mm -hmm. And so I really believe in both. And I think Seth Godin is somebody who does it exceptionally well. He straddles both worlds where his books are published by a major publisher and they get out to the world. He does things on other platforms which go out to the world, but he's also built an incredibly strong and powerful community on his own. And you know, in a world where we talk about hybrid, I think that hybrid is a great way and sometimes not even hybrid, sometimes just owning it yourself and using these other larger distribution channels as simply that distribution channels and cutting deals like that. So you've seen that happen with people like Joe Rogan and his deal with Spotify. He had a large audience, but they paid him a ridiculous amount of money to go through their audience. And even if they drop him, he'll still have his audience of millions and millions of people who yeah. want to hear his thinking. So those are some of the ways we can think about it. But I would be, it would be hard for me to make the argument that nobody needs it. I think certain people in order to build audience need to find an audience and social platforms are the lowest hanging fruit to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it, love it. Yeah, I think Stephen King and Seth Godin uh, Pay attention, pay attention to priorities, you know, to their strong sides. They like to write. For sure. So, uh, Joe Rogan can uh, film content or uh, record audio podcast. It's strong side. He doesn't write. <laughs> so, and yeah. yeah. But that's an important lesson. And I talk about that in even my earliest of work, which is if you're thinking about how you create content, the easiest way to start is to think about what would be the thing you can't stop doing. So it's similar for me, I like to write. So I really enjoy writing longer pieces and spending time with it and toiling with the words. I also like to speak. 
So typically I will do things like audio podcasting and radio. Video is something I don't do often just because video has always been a challenge for me. I'm not as comfortable in front of the camera as you might be or as Joe might be. I like having that ability to not look into the camera, but to stare off and think as I'm speaking to somebody. So you have to find within you what it is that you can't stop doing. Again, I'm not great with short form type content, so I've never done well on Twitter or X, LinkedIn and other platforms where it's a lot of self-promotion. I typically don't do great there either. I feel more like a journalist than a self-promoter. So you, the beauty of all this is there's not one right or wrong way to do it. The beauty is understanding the type of content you love to create and then finding the platform by which you can create it and distribute it. I do believe that we live in a world where a lot of people are talking more about their own fame than perhaps how they got famous or might become famous which is providing value. And I do think that the journalist mindset, which I started off in journalism, it still is very heavy on my brain. So I'm just constantly trying to create valuable content versus letting people know that I'm really smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Love it, love it. And I think if Mark Twain had Twitter on his time, he couldn't grow his audience because he can't write a short letter. <laughs> he has or, or, or who knows, maybe he would be like the <laughs> ultimate content creator because look, we do, we have worlds where, you know, I jokingly talk about my podcast, Six Pixels of Separation as being long form. In a world where my shows are, you know, 40 to 50 to 60 minutes, it doesn't feel like that's long form anymore in a world where you have Lex Friedman doing three, three and a half hour shows and many other podcasters doing that are just streaming constantly. So even our definitions of long form and short form are expanding. And I'd make the case that Mark Twain would probably find a brilliant audience, but it would be one that wanted more long form content, yeah. which is great. I mean, look, people want that. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I want to ask more about headlines. Um, we touched a little bit about headlines, writing headlines. I remember David Ogilvy, one of the best marketers ever, he mentioned, if you spend uh, a dollar to create content, 80% uh, should come to headline. And for example, Seth Godin, um, if you take this book, Purple Cow, you don't need to read the book if you have no time, but you can understand everything from this short headline. Uh, can you tell how to do it? Because when AI was launched, I can see a lot of AI written headlines, unlocking, um, on discovering, something like this. And uh, it's hard to stand out from the rest if you use this AI headlines. Uh, can you tell your methods how to craft headline? Because if you have no great headline, People don't know if you have great content. They have no time to open your content. Any tips about that? Yeah, I mean, Anatoly, I feel like I'm going to be telling you what to do without knowing truly how to do it myself. It's the great mystery. And I think the people who are excellent at creating headlines have a really unique and different gift. I do think that the generative AI tools that I've been using, once they start understanding my style and I've inputted ideas, have become almost better than I can at creating something. And when I say that, it's very personal. I look at the headline and think that's better, but I don't have any split A-B testing or data to support one versus the other. When we talk about things like Purple Cow, what I think is interesting is he took a word that could have been a sentence on how to get extremely great at branding and turned it into Purple Cow which becomes this thing of purple cow. Cows aren't purple. What does that mean? It's about standing out and building something unique, something that people would look at, and bring other people to and talk about. And that's what makes it so brilliant. You have people who create titles like The Tipping Point. And a title like that it can transcend everything. It becomes a word we use in sentences, which is extremely powerful. But we've also seen book titles and article titles do extremely well when it's things like the 10 best ways to build the best e-newsletter marketing strategy, whatever it might be. So you have this idea of creating a branded, unique title. You have this idea of being very descriptive. You have the ability to be very prescriptive. I don't necessarily believe that there's a one way or another. I've seen both work exceptionally well. 
like really, really well. You look at Ryan Holiday's book titles. If you think about people like Anne Handley and how she talks about writing and how she writes about it and creates titles, these are exceptionally smart people that are approaching it tactically very, very differently. And one doesn't have a better result than the other. Personally, it's just personal. I tend to like the uniqueness of a purple cow versus a prescriptive title like how to become the best brand marketer. But I understand and have read mm. both types of books and valued from both. So I can't sit here and tell you definitively, you know, this is what you do. In some options, you'll also see many of the search engine optimization experts tell you you need to have really good subtitles. You need to have very prescriptive keyword dense copy if you want anybody to find it. So you can use a playful title, but in and of itself, nobody would be looking for that phrasing. And so you have to support it in another way, shape or form. So all of these are you know, both creative and tactical decisions that marketers have to make. It's hard to stand out if you don't have a title like Purple Cow, but it's hard to be heard with a title like Purple Cow. So you have to yeah. figure out the balance and how you support it with the content. And then ultimately, I think really what it boils down to is, is one of two things. Either you have somewhat of a unique voice in the industry, or over time, as you build that voice and others start creating content that's similar to it, you have a unique voice within a frame of people who are looking at that type of content and going, oh, Mitch Joel's a unique voice in that, or Anatoly's a unique voice in this, versus being the only one doing it, which is a good place to start at the beginning. If you can be the only one or one of few that are talking about you know, generative AI in the world of architects, I'm sure there are, but if there weren't, that would be an interesting place to start to be unique. So the uniqueness of it too is a huge factor in creating results that will get you headlines that get attention. Awesome, awesome, valuable. Um, you, rem you remind me our project, one project um, that was about weight loss. And uh, the company said to us, if you get traffic fast, we can bring a huge contract. Um, we analyzed the project, you know, it's hard, it's tough to get yeah, results fast. <laughs> yeah. But luckily on this project, uh, what we found, uh, all titles were written for the sake of having them. So, uh, without even providing a solid reason to click, to open so generic, this website, uh, had, uh, hundred K traffic and uh, we analyzed and found, wow. We, we can rewrite just these titles. Uh, we rewrote and uh, traffic was increased two times in a month. Uh, uh, in the niche, when a billion dollar companies in the top 10 results, weight loss uh, in the US, and we got this traffic uh, just to rewrite all these uh, titles, uh, meta tags, uh, and we got results. Uh, yeah. yeah, we spent time with uh, uh agent numbers uh brackets uh, with we analyze how we can stand out from the rest and i think it's important to uh, not to use templates in titles if you use templates <laughs> you can't be creative because you, you can use templates everywhere but not in titles <laughs> it's, but it's that's so you know what, what you're talking about is a technical thinking which requires some creativity to not only beat competitors who've been doing it also with a similar approach, but an algorithm that is weighted towards who's paying the most or yeah. who is adding the most value. And I do think there's a lot of brands, whether you can or can't break through that in a short period of time, congrats if you can. I still think it's really challenging for most businesses because we do, we live in a world where these are primarily mini monopolies that have can, that control both the advertising side and the content and the algorithm side of it. So it's always this game of chicken and egg. I was involved in search engines long before Google existed and was there at the early days of building out a lot of the payment platforms that we see now, whether it's bidding on keywords or paying for sponsorship or having banners or advertising linked to a specific keyword search. And it was very different in those days, but being active in it and then seeing Google come into the fold and seeing all the people acquire that and watching the competition happen within search it you know it really is a scientific technical creative and paying strategy that gets you there and also look as you know just basic even search engine optimization it's a, it's a long tail in these days 
it doesn't happen overnight. It's hard to rank quickly and fast, especially on terms where there's any form of, of real search volume. It's not as easy as it used to be. Yeah, almost impossible. I even analyze the traffic uh, from uh, Fred's net, a new social media platform, a lot of PR. Almost all publications in the world, social media uh, share this uh, uh, social media. And today, only 100k traffic from Google. <laughs> After six months and all these publications, it's almost nothing, you know? So yeah. it, takes, it takes time even for big companies. Yeah, I mean, I think people just fundamentally believe that, you know, the internet makes things faster, cheaper, and easier. And I think that the internet makes things a bit slower, a bit more expensive, and much more complex. <laughs> And I say that not to dissuade people from doing it, but if you approach it like that, when you have quick wins, it makes it easier to understand. I've been creating content forever now, over 20 years, thousands and thousands of articles and posts and audio. And you know that if I were to transfer that domain to another domain, it would be penalized. It's not appreciated. Uh, yeah. It's just the nature of it. Older content doesn't hold much value. Google sees that now as being old content and not relevant, even though it might be hyper relevant. So it's this weird game of, of checks and balances and also understanding that everyone is at the mercy of a corporation that's looking to increase revenue and users and size. And based on that would work today, probably won't work as effectively tomorrow. I think some of the baseline stuff remains true and constant how a page is built the words we use how we structure things i think those still are constants but the rules do dance and change often mm -hmm. uh you said many times this word change um i even lost track uh, how many times you pronounce this word uh, uh, can you tell the difference between transformation and change change if we speak about tales uh what kind of difference because I see when companies uh, can't adapt fast. They have some methods, they work, but uh, it doesn't mean uh, they will work uh, all the time. So we need to, to change or adapt or trans <laughs> to use transformation. So tell the difference between this. Yeah, when I think of that word, it's funny. I'd love to go back and count because then I start thinking that I have a vocal tick and I should change the word that when I use the word change. Um, but I think about this quote from an excellent book by Tom Peters called Reimagine. I love that book still to this day. If I see it in a used bookstore, I'll pick it up because I think it's out of print. And he has a quote in that book, which isn't from Tom Peters, but from a General Eric Shinseki from the U.S. Army, retired now. And General Shinseki says, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Mm -hmm. And I always loved that quote. I use that quote still in a lot of my keynote presentations with a hat tip to Tom Peters and General Shinseki, of course. So I don't know that they're not words you can't intersperse. It's probably just a vernacular thing where it makes more sense for me to say the word change than transformation or innovation, because that might make me sound somewhat pompous. But that idea of you, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less is true. If you think about doing work in, let's call it search engine optimization, and now suddenly you have generative AI tools. Suddenly you have systems that might be able to detect when you're writing with a generative AI tool. So how do you use that to your benefit in a world where we're seeing more and more content proliferate? It's important that we as brands and stewards of brands and people who run businesses really embrace the fact that technology has pushed things in different directions. In fact, I hate talking about speed. Whenever I talk about technology, the trope is things are always changing fast fast the technology moves i and when i think about my life and my career i think every moment of it was things are moving fast so i put i put that aside what i think now helps bring that idea together is this idea that we have probably more than ever the largest discernible market that's connected to technology and i think a big provocation of that was the covid pandemic the fact that you had younger kids suddenly digitally enabled we suddenly really taught our elder population how to use these tools whether it's an ipad or a laptop or online ordering or online banking whatever it might be so the market expanded dramatically which is one aspect of it. And then I also believe that because of it and because of the forced lockdowns and how everybody reacted, 
that businesses really had to look at themselves from small to medium to large to nonprofits to whatever it might be to, to ask themselves, how digitally enabled are we? So it's not the fact that there's speed. I think speed and technology go hand in hand and things will always change and move quickly. I do think it's interesting for us to think about all of these things, whether it's disruption, innovation, change. And again, you could probably either play with those words or argue the nuance of why both of them are different to the realities that we have the largest audience that's digitally enabled than we've ever had even though we have those who still don't have access to it. And we have more than ever, even individual or small local businesses understanding that they need some type of connected strategy to that. And then lastly, I would just make the argument that the reason I won't define change against innovation is because even if I give you a definition, I think the challenge that we have, especially in the polarized world that we're in now is definitions don't matter without context. So I can give you a definition of innovation or why it's different from disruption, but the context by which I'm placing it might be fundamentally different from your context. So change to me might be very different from change to somebody who is just in a startup or change to someone who's running a multi-billion dollar B2B SaaS operation. Mm -hmm. So that's my fear. And I think a lot of the polarization we have in the world today is everybody provides definitions. Few people have an agreement on what the context is for that. Mm -hmm. Valuable, valuable. Uh, Mitch, I want to ask about something that I disagree, but it doesn't mean that I'm right about that. <laughs> I'm yeah. often wrong when I disagree. Don't worry. You won't be the first. <laughs> yeah. About rebranding. Um, it's popular. It's not popular. Sometimes we need to make rebranding. Uh, and um, uh, I had one project when the owner of the project hated uh, the name of uh, website. So I, uh, but we had results traffic we had some sales we had audience uh, but the old domain name uh, had limits with publications with media coverage because many big websites ignored our press releases pitches uh, because of name that was long uh, and uh, had uh, keywords like binary options uh, uh, it's trading niche so what we did we rebranded uh spent some time of course we lost traffic uh, in the beginning like in the first three months but painful. then yeah <laughs> painful but then we acquired even more so tell what you mean about rebranding that it's not good idea or uh, how to do it right because m many things why people or companies make rebranding oh anatoly i think i just built you a trap in the last conversation and you just walked right into the trap, right? <laughs> what's the definition of the rebrand and what's the context of it? Mm -hmm. So there's no unified way to answer this. What we've, mm -hmm. what I would think of philosophically is what are we trying to do here? And how do we do this? Not in the context of, I want to leave my mark or this isn't working, but understanding that for the most part, all of these businesses and brands are going to transcend us. And so the analogy I would give is if you live in a certain community in a certain part of the world and you buy a very old house, while you own the house and you may have a mortgage or not, that's not relevant. You really are to the city, a custodian of this house that you can't just change and do whatever you want. You're buying a historical potential type of, of home. I think brands have or should have that same type of provenance to them. And I feel like most marketers don't act as great custodians for the brand. They act as great advocates for their own brilliance. Mm -hmm. So when I think of rebranding, I'm really looking at it more from how are we going to take the brand and leave it in a better place than how we found it. And I'm not saying more often than not, that doesn't mean we have to blow everything up and start over. There may in fact be cases where that's really, really important to do, mm -hmm. but brands typically have legacy brands typically exist for a reason. And I often will look sideways at organizations that destroy or completely rebrand without really seeing a material difference in what the outcome has done. So you could take even from 
you know, just graphic interfaces and looking at things of how a logo, which is just one component of, of a brand communication, can evolve over the years. We almost don't notice it, but if you look at year by year, you notice oh, a little color there, a little tweak there, a little change in font, a little serif here, and not, you know, you see this evolution where it, it manages to feel modern and relevant. Um, my, my business partner and, and CEO of the agency would call it noticeably new. This idea that it feels memorable and recognizable, but but new and fresh at the same time. I tend to appreciate those type of chief marketing officers over the ones that want to come in and blow everything up as if everything that was done before isn't great until I got here. So rebrands are important. They're a part of our world. Sometimes they're required because the brand just no longer resonates. Sometimes it's done because the culture and the times have yeah. changed. You can no longer do that. Look at brands like Aunt Jemima and things like that, where hmm. you can't do Think about all the sports teams that have had to rebrand because of just how the culture and the nature of us of people have changed and evolved and matured. So we see this every single day in, in the world. And I think the idea of rebranding is very important relative to the definition, the context, and the outcome. Yeah. And those are the things we need to look at. So when we look at the great rebrands of the world, perhaps we should really be looking at where was it before and what did this rebrand do to actually material, materially impact uh, everybody yeah. from not just the business, but the actual customers. Did it really help change the customer perception? Yeah, you clarified. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Mitch, I want to ask about something that I do a lot. I think everyone uh, can make a lot of mistakes. But it's part of our job <laughs> to make mistakes. Yeah. Usually, yeah, I usually start from best practices, generic methods. Then I fail. All the time I fail. <laughs> then I can learn, acquire experience, and go ahead. For example, I started PR yeah. uh, myself to learn the process. I wrote a bunch of press releases, pitch all of them, got zero mentions, zero <laughs> results. <laughs> then I learn how it works. And today I hired experts who can write great press releases. I hired specialists who can pitch them and we got mentions on cnn bloomberg dow jones many, many great websites big websites forbes yeah. uh, can you tell about mistakes that we can avoid i know it's part of the job to make mistakes but we can learn some mistakes before doing them so if you can list yeah i mean look when in the history of anything have we ever had a better opportunity to learn from people who have made the mistake before us I mean, that's just the general thinking. So you could say, oh, yeah, I want to do PR and suddenly you're writing press releases or you could spend a couple of months just looking at books, videos, podcasts, go to your local library, interview people for your show. <laughs> you have a show. If I wanted to start PR, I'd probably do a whole series on how to start PR and speak to great people who have walked and done those mistakes prior to us. So. You're right. I don't think it's a question of how you avoid mistakes. I think it's a question of how do you mitigate risk. Yeah. And the analogy I would give is we live in a world where somebody who's gone ahead who can clear the brush as you walk on this path is, is supremely valuable. And by the way, it doesn't just have to be a digital asset or a physical book. Local communities and associations. There's so many associations related to things like communications and public relations that you could take webinars on, meet locally, have a meetup, take somebody on, find a mentor, someone younger, someone older. So when I hear stories like that, my general reaction is would I hire or work with somebody who had this weird self reliance attitude in a world where information is so available? Think about LinkedIn Learning, Skillshare, all these places beyond just people that are more than willing to help or share or help you get started. Yeah. So no reason to make crazy mistakes. Uh, but of course, as we do them, we're going to tweak because every best case study, every white paper is its own unique story that is not going to be replicated by anyone. Awesome. Awesome. I have a bunch of questions, but uh, I recommend to anyone if you have questions too subscribe to mitch joel podcast to learn more from mitch uh, and i just ask one question uh, sure. the last question about your experience i often get this question from my audience uh, how to learn from scratch and i, I can explain who uh, who usually ask this question the first students 
who are looking for ways to learn from scratch, especially when many things change. Uh, and the second audience, business owners uh, who uh, wanna get the basic. So if they have the basic, they can know uh, what kind of experts, uh, consultants can help them to get results or companies. So let's imagine you started today from scratch without any experience, knowledge, skills. It's your first day. What will you do if you start from scratch? I would definitely go on to someplace like LinkedIn. It could be X, it could be Facebook. And I would say, this is day one for me. I'm starting from scratch in the industry of public relations. Give me the five smartest things I should follow, read, people to speak to, people to follow that will help me get better and understand it quicker. And in more instances than not, you will have a lot of feedback that you will have to filter through, but then it's really deep diving into it. And I believe that you can learn in public too. And that's essentially what my blog and my podcast are. It's me learning in public. I choose somebody who's written a book who's much smarter than me about that topic. And I ask them questions. And the, the, the head fake is I publish it and I share it with the world. But all that is for me is an hour where I've cornered an expert in an area or subject I don't know much about. And I'm able to ask them questions or provocations or even my own thinking to have them disabuse me of either how wrong I am or, or maybe even enlighten them where they think about it. So again, taking some of the concepts we've talked about you know, throughout this show and just asking. We live in a world, and I think, Anatoly, you're somebody who probably has lived and breathed this with what you've been through, where you probably use the channel to ask for help in a certain way, whether it was professional, whether it was for your family, whether it was where you're traveling throughout the world. I do it all the time. I'll say things like, I am going to Miami. Give me the top five things I have to see. And wow, the list you get yeah. back is, is pretty incredible. So this isn't one of those things where... In the old days, I would tell you, go to the library and ask the librarian. Essentially, you can still do that. And I'm a big believer in libraries. And then once you have that, burrow, like go deep, go deep, really learn, yeah. really understand. But I don't think I would do the work without burrowing, learning, and then also trying to create something out of that, a podcast, an article, something to get feedback to see if my thinking is anywhere near that level. And from there, I would probably start working with somebody where it, we can make mistakes and it wouldn't be so terrible. So maybe you have a friend who has a nonprofit or there's a local charity that's not doing this stuff well, you could offer and volunteer your services while explaining to them, we're gonna make some mistakes here, but you'll learn and get, get free stuff and I'll learn by trying to do this. So tons of ways to do it now. Awesome, awesome, love it, love it, Mitch. It's, it's a big pleasure to get on the show. I love this experience. Uh, I'm going to subscribe to your podcast, to your blog. I want to read all this valuable information. I recommend to anyone to do it as well. You can see a lot of valuable insights. Tell the best way how to keep learning from you, how to reach out to you, how to follow you. It's right there, sixpixels.com or go to thinkers1.com. And great meeting you and thanks for having me. Nice. Awesome. Guys, you can find all the links in the description below, including LinkedIn profile, sixpixels.com. So uh, if you have any questions, you can ask Mitch, but please don't spam uh, <laughs> or, or ask me. I'll lead this question. Okay, guys. Love you. See you.